Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Megan Nguyen and I'm the Community Events Manager at the Peninsula Open Space Trust and I'll be your host for tonight. You're watching The Tales of Two Cities, Wildlife Connectivity from the Bay to LA. It is the best of times, it is the worst of times. We live in a time where the invention of roads and freeways have transformed the ways we travel. But did you know that wildlife also need their own roads to connect them to food, water, and mates? The roads we use every day are the same roads that cut off wildlife paths to resources, creating dangerous situations where they try to cross a busy freeway and oftentimes don't end up making it. Tonight, over the next hour and a half, you will hear from three scientists and speakers who will share tales of their work and learn how we can help people and wildlife coexist and thrive. We may even answer the age old question, how did the cougar cross the road? The schedule for tonight is broken up into three parts. First, we'll introduce you to the speakers and hear a little bit about their story. Next, each speaker will have time to present on their work. And lastly, we will end with a Q&A session from our live audience and pre-submitted questions. We won't have time to pause for questions throughout, but we'll do our best to address them at the end. So type them in the chat. For those of you who are new to post work, we are a nonprofit land trust and our mission is to protect open spaces on the peninsula and South Bay for the benefit of all. We are creating a network of protected lands where people and nature connect and thrive. Since 1977, Post has protected over 80,000 acres of land. Our work is also not possible without the many partners we work closely with and rely on. Wildlife knows no borders and need connectivity that expand beyond regional districts. Thank you to our partners who continue working hard with us to stay connected and coordinated to protect wildlife and people. Tonight's event is presented in partnership with the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, and Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency, as well as the National Wildlife Federation. Before we dive into the program, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement. Speaking on behalf of the Bay Area Conservation Partners included in this event, our working area includes the territories of the Amamutsin, Muwekma Ohlone, Ramatish Ohlone, Tamiya Nation, as well as other native organizations and individuals who are descended from the first people of this land. This conversation today will also be focusing on the broader landscape of California, including specifically the territories of the Tongva and Chumash nation, but also the lands in between and beyond that has been home to hundreds of indigenous tribes since time immemorial and whose people are still here with us today. I want to acknowledge the land itself including the Santa Cruz and Diablo Mountains, the Santa Monica Mountains in the south, all the mountain ranges, watersheds, and valleys in between these places and the Pacific Ocean to our west that make up the landscape we call our home. Wherever you are, those are tuning in, please pause and acknowledge the people whose native land you are on by typing them in the chat. If you don't know, uh, we're gonna drop a link so you can find out whose native land you occupy. For those of you typing in the chat, uh, keep them coming. Thank you. Let this moment serve as a reminder that we are all residents of this place now, and we have the responsibility to be caretakers of our shared home and neighbors, including wildlife. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers to you tonight. First, we have Marian Vernon, the Wildlife Linkages Program Manager at the Peninsula Open Space Trust. Marion works to protect and enhance connectivity for wildlife through land transactions, restoration, and wildlife crossing infrastructure projects in partnerships with public agencies and other organizations. Next, we have Beth Pratt, the California Regional Executive Director of the National Wildlife Federation. Beth has worked in environmental leadership roles for over 25 years, including national parks such as Yosemite and Yellowstone. In her current role, Beth says she has the best job in the world. While advocating for the state's remarkable animals, she gets to travel around California and spend time with condors, mountain lions, 
foxes, and more animals, and work with amazing people who help wildlife thrive. And lastly, we have Sarah Newkirk, the executive director of the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. Sarah is an energetic conservation strategist with a passion for innovation, collaboration, and communication. Sarah finds joy in bringing nature and into communities by uncovering the myriad values that the land has for people. Let's welcome our speakers to the stage. Hello. Hey Beth, hey Sarah, how's it going? Hi you guys. You. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, before we dive into the great content you'll be sharing with us today, I was wondering if you could all answer this question and share a little bit about yourself. How did you get into this work? Let's start with you, Marion. Hi, thanks, Megan. Thanks for kicking it off. And I just want to say how great it is to be sharing the stage with Beth and Sarah tonight. Really admire both of these amazing women. Um, and so a little bit about me and how I got into this field. I've always been really interested in wildlife and animals, and I come from a family of animal lovers and musicians. And I thought that my path was going to be a musician as well. Um, but then when I was in college, I was visiting a nature museum in Chicago and saw somebody holding this fox snake. And I was like, I want to be the person holding that fox snake. And so I switched majors to environmental studies, and I've been working in this field ever since. And I did my graduate work at the Yale School of the Environment, focused on elk and grizzly bear management in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And after that, I moved out to California and I've been working on land and wildlife conservation for the past seven years in the Bay Area and also in the Sierra Nevada. And I'll pass it on to Beth. Thanks, Marion. And just want to echo your sentiments about being on the stage with, with two awesome uh, other, well, three other awesome women. It's, uh, it's going to be a fun talk tonight. Um, so, you know, I trace this back. It's just kind of when wasn't there a time I wanted to advocate for wildlife. I used to collect uh, toads and frogs in my backyard. And when I was six, I think it was the first time I realized how vulnerable wildlife in the natural world was when a for sale sign went up for this land I used to play on with a creek. And I went around collecting money so that we could buy it. Uh, it was called Indian Rock. And uh, and you can probably, you know, guess how that one ended. But I think uh, the rest of the uh, my life, I've made sure it doesn't end that way, that we actually are trying to be successful in protecting wildlife and nature. Uh, most of my career has been in national parks. I actually live outside Yosemite and I worked there for a decade and worked in Yellowstone as well. But uh, the last 10 years have been really focused on what I see the future, which is urban wildlife conservation and sharing our spaces. So uh, it's, again, it's, it's a life's work. It's really not a career. And I'm going to pass it to Sarah. Thanks, Beth, and I am also very glad to be here and excited to share the stage with you all. Um, I have always been uh, directed toward environmental work, but it really was through an initial foray into science. I have a master's degree in oceanography, and so I was really focused for the first part of my career on wet wildlife as opposed to dry wildlife. Um, I turned out to be a terrible scientist, but I am a, quite a good lawyer, <laughs> and that's sort of my other uh, professional focus. In the early part of my career, I spent, I, I went to law school because I had a passion for suing the government, <laughs> and um, I spent the first part of my career um, involved in litigating against government for failure to do non-discretionary duties. And so, um, I, in the last 20 years or so. Uh, transitioned to more collaborative forms of environmentalism. I worked with the Nature Conservancy in both New York and California uh, for 16 years um, before joining the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County here. And um, I inherited a bunch of connectivity work because Santa Cruz County is such an amazing place that it has oceans within uh, an hour's drive of mountain lion habitat. And so I came here wanting to continue my pursuit of coastal conservation um, but I have developed the passion for um, wildlife connectivity in the mountains um, during, during my tenure here. And I'll pass it back to Megan. Thank you. And thank you all for sharing your story. I love hearing where you all are coming from. And it sounds like there's this core theme of passion and caring that stems from way back. And um, I'm just excited to hear what you all have to say. So 
Speaking of that, can you share a little bit about what you'll be talking about today? Give us a little teaser. Marion, why don't you start? Sure. So I'll be kicking us off with an overview of what we mean when we talk about wildlife connectivity. So what does that mean? What are the solutions and challenges associated with trying to um, protect wildlife connectivity? And then I'll highlight some of Post's work in Coyote Valley around wildlife connectivity improvements. Pass it over to you, Beth. Thanks, Marion. So for me, uh, I think it's shifted a little bit since we planned this and that obviously P22 death, I think the focus is gonna be a little more on P22, but also how he influenced and helped build the wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing. And I think, you know, if there's a theme, it's uh, although my undergrad is in the biology field, I have an MBA and I think focusing on how to approach this work maybe a little differently to get the public support and the funding than perhaps we've done traditionally in conservation. And, and P-22 is a big part of that story. And I'm passing it to you, Sarah. Sorry, forgot to do that. <laughs> no worries. And I'll, I'll tell you, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the land trust's work in actually installing a wildlife crossing um, across the hair raising Highway 17 uh, which is a north-south route in Santa Cruz County. Um, the wildlife crossing is um, amazingly almost done, but it was not without a tremendous amount of struggle through a process that didn't really exist. And so um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, building the plane while we were flying it and, and what we've learned and how we think it might be easier going forward. Thank you. That sounds like a great flow. So we got some science back from, from Marion, some advocacy and story about P22 from Beth, and Sarah will give us a little bit into a look into the process and how this works. Um, all right, Sarah and Beth, we're gonna say goodbye to you for now, and we'll start off with you, Marion. Why don't you take it away? Great, thank you. All right. So I wanted to start by talking about what we mean by wildlife connectivity and why it's important. So wildlife connectivity means how well a landscape facilitates movement by different animals. And so if, as you can imagine, a landscape that has a lot of native vegetation, native habitat is going to be easier for wildlife to move through than say suburban development or agricultural lands, although it, it really varies on the species they're looking at. And wildlife connectivity is important for, right, for a variety of different movements that species make uh, both on a daily and weekly basis, um, seasonally, and throughout their, their lifetime. So I wanted to highlight some of those movements to get you a sense of the scale uh, at which these movements occur and why we need this wildlife connectivity. So starting with daily movements. So animals need to uh, need wildlife connectivity so they can find food and shelter and mates and care for their offspring. So this can vary on depending on the type of species. So if you're a kangaroo rat, you might do all of those movements within 50 square meters. But if you're a male mountain lion, you might need up to 100 square miles in the Santa Cruz mountains to complete all of those different tasks. So it's kind of like the things that you might do on your day-to-day -day basis, your day-to-day -day routine of like getting groceries at the grocery store, picking up your kids from daycare, going to work, coming home, things like that. We also need wildlife connectivity for seasonal movements that animals might make. So for example, uh, California newts um, in the wintertime when it's rainy and the creeks and water bodies are filling up with water, uh, these California newts will migrate to these water bod bodies where they will breed. And once uh, the season change, changes again, it starts getting warmer, they'll migrate back to their upland habitats. And so that's really critical for their population health. Um, so if those migration routes are cut off by human development or roads, uh, that could have really significant implications for how well a species like a California newt or a deer uh, can um, maintain their population over time. We also need wildlife connectivity so that animals can go out into the world and establish new territories through a process we call dispersal. So going back to our mountain lion example, uh, if you are a young mountain lion, um, you're living with mom and you get to a certain age, you wanna venture out and establish your own new territory. So it's kind of like if you're a parent and you have a teenager living uh, at home and gets to a certain age where they need to go and establish a new territory in a dorm room, for example. So we need to have these connections so that an animal like a mountain lion can disperse and have enough room and enough space and enough habitat to establish a new territory. 
And if there's limited habitat for those animals to be able to do that, it can cause like competition for resources among other individuals of that species. And the final type of movement I wanted to highlight for wildlife connectivity is actually uh, species and individuals that might relocate to new habitats that they haven't occurred in previously. So this is especially important to think about with climate change. So if you think about a species that might live on, in a mountain range at lower elevations, as the climate changes and things get warmer and drier and you don't have air conditioning, you need to go somewhere that is a little bit more suitable for you to live. So that might mean moving up higher in elevation where, it, where it's a little bit cooler. And that might mean going into a habitat that you weren't able to live in previously, but because of climate change, you're actually shifting your range into this new habitat location. And so all of these wildlife movements, uh, we need connectivity and we need intact habitat and connections between habitat in order to make sure that animals have places to go. And so to hone in on a specific landscape here, uh, POST works to protect and enhance wildlife connectivity in the peninsula and the South Bay of California's Bay Area. And we're particularly interested in providing connections between the Santa Cruz Mountains and the rest of California. So in this picture, uh, we're on the side of the Diablo Range looking west towards the Santa Cruz Mountains across the city of San Jose. And what's really interesting about the Santa Cruz Mountains is that they're virtually an island of habitat surrounded by a, a sea of development and the literal sea of the Pacific Ocean and the San Francisco Bay Area. And so if you're an animal uh, living in the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, there is not a lot of locations for you to disperse or move out of these mountains to pursue those different types of movements that we discussed on the previous slide. So there's urban development to contend with. And then of course, there are all these roads and highways that uh, can create these barriers to movement and can also lead to uh, injury and death of animals that try and cross some of these formidable barriers like US 101. So at POST, we're trying to uh, address this issue by protecting land and core habitat and then also restore habitat for these animals and then tackle the issue of roads and highways, which is something that uh, both of our other speakers will be highlighting a lot later on in this presentation. And so another way to look at this is this, this is a map that was shown at the start of the webinar tonight. Um, this map shows areas of high connectivity potential for animals to fulfill these types of movements within the San Francisco Bay Area. And so the Santa Cruz Mountains are coming down on the left side of the screen. And I wanted to highlight this one swath of habitat that's located just south of the city of San Jose. And this area is called Coyote Valley. And this is a location where there is still this connectivity potential for wildlife to move into and out of the Santa Cruz Mountains um, into the neighboring Diablo Range, which connects to the rest of California. So scientists and other organizations and individuals have really honed in on Coyote Valley as this critical wildlife linkage to help uh, maintain and enhance the connectivity in this landscape. And Megan is gonna put a link in the chat to, for a blog post that'll help explain a little bit more about what makes a healthy wildlife linkage in case you wanna do some further reading after this webinar. And so this is an image of Coyote Valley looking uh, west across the valley floor to towards the Santa Cruz Mountains. And uh, over the past few years, POST has been working with our partners to protect this valley floor and to protect the wildlife habitat and wildlife connectivity that this valley offers us in this region. And so over the past five years, uh, POST has worked with organizations like the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority in the city of San Jose to protect over 1,500 acres of this valley bottom landscape that was at risk of being developed. And if that development had happened, we would have lost one of these last remaining connections into and out of the Santa Cruz Mountains, which could have had really negative impacts for our local wildlife and biodiversity. And so fortunately, we've protected a lot of the valley bottom habitat already, and we are moving forward uh, with a planning process being led by the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority 
to plan for how we use this landscape moving forward. So thinking about the habitat restoration needs that uh, have to happen to restore functional connectivity for animals, and then also thinking about the other benefits that this landscape can provide for us, including flood protection and groundwater recharge and opportunities for people to get out and connect with nature. And as part of this uh, planning effort, science plays a really important role. And science can also help us understand how wildlife are moving through places like Coyote Valley currently and help us understand the actions we can take to further increase connectivity. So I wanted to highlight one of many studies that has been done in Coyote Valley that's helped inform how we're thinking about connectivity and addressing some of the roads and highways in this area. Um, so several years ago, uh, with funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Post partnered with uh, numerous organizations and agencies, including the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, UC Santa Cruz, Pathways for Wildlife, and the Santa Clara Valley Habitat, Habitat Agency to uh, trap and radio collar 26 bobcats uh, found in Coyote Valley. And so these radio tracking collars show where animals are moving across the landscape and can tell us information about how animals are interacting with different roads and different habitat features. And we can use this information to help plan for where we might restore habitat and where there's a need for wildlife crossings. And you can meet the bobcats that were tracked in the study in a blog post and Megan's gonna put a link to that in the chat. And I just wanted to share this amazing video footage um, put together by Pathways for Wildlife of one of these bobcats um, captured on camera traveling through a creek bed. And so the results of this study were really interesting and helped us think about where we can do some wildlife crossing enhancements for bobcats and other animals. So in this map, um, this is a map of Coyote Valley and the city of San Jose is located on the left side of the map. And each of these colored lines represents one of the bobcats that was tracked in this study. And it shows the movements that that bobcat made throughout the course of the study that was completed. And the few things were really interesting from this study. One was that a lot of bobcats were moving along Fisher Creek, which is this riparian corridor that goes through the valley. It's kind of like Bobcat Highway. So that told us that that was a really important existing movement path for bobcats. Another interesting finding was just how bobcats were interacting with the roads in Coyote Valley. So US 101 is running across the top of the screen here. And what was really fascinating to learn was that bobcats were successfully using a series of culverts and bridge underpasses to move safely beneath US 101 without getting hit by cars. A bit in contrast, Monterey Road, which runs parallel to US 101 on the other side, on the west side, is a barrier to bobcat movement. So you can see the, the lines of bobcats that are running up against the Monterey Road as this virtual barrier to their movement. And Monterey Road features a large concrete median barrier that makes it virtually impossible for animals to cross without getting hit by cars. And so it's data like this, um, along with data on roadkill and wildlife vehicle collisions that helped highlight the importance of addressing Monterey Road um, to help design some wildlife crossings that can facilitate safe passage for wildlife. And so I'm really excited to announce that POST is partnering with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority and the city of San Jose to begin a planning process to identify some wildlife crossing options for Monterey Road and plan for some wildlife crossing structures along Monterey Road that will help facilitate movement, safe passage for bobcats and other animals. So we're really excited to be kicking off this, this planning process um, this year and I'm really excited to hear from Sarah and Beth about their experience navigating um, the planning efforts for wildlife crossing structures. So I have a lot to learn from both of them and I'm excited about seeing how the project progresses over time. With that, I'm happy to kick it back to Megan. Thank you, Marian. I really love learning about that Bobcat study. And for those of you watching, 
I really encourage you to click on that link to read more about that blog and look a little bit closer at that map because there's so many interesting um, like kind of trails that you can follow. I, I, there's one bobcat that kind of like circles around the neighborhood kind of in the top left corner that I thought was interesting. Um, Marion, a question like, so these culverts, are they, were they made for wildlife crossing or how do, how do animals kind of naturally know how to use them? Yeah, so the ones along US 101 that the bobcats were using, most of them were made to transport water beneath the highway. So it is really just amazing what animals, how animals can adapt to human landscapes and see, you know, a culvert that was maybe constructed for a human purpose of conveying water so that the road doesn't flood. And then animals find these, these pieces of infrastructure, human infrastructure, and are able to figure out how to use them and use them successfully as a passageway, essentially. And of course, we can also construct culverts that are specifically used for animals and designed for animals more specifically as well. Awesome. Yeah. I, so like the culverts are kind of what we see in the images, the famous like coyote and badger images. And there's so many game cameras footage that we have that really shows the animals kind of like figuring it out what this is, but some are naturally have been, you know, used to using these. Is that right? Yeah. And I would say, you know, depending on the type of animal, some animals are more willing to go into certain culverts than others. Um, so mountain lions are typical cats and they're quite finicky. And so they might inspect a culvert and be like, you know, this is too dark. This is too narrow. I'm not going in there. Um, I mean, I don't know if other people live with house cats, but I got my cat a really expensive cat bed and they will not sit on it. <laughs> and they think it's some sort of black hole. And it's just Cats are finicky. So when it comes to mountain lions and designing structures for mountain lions, we really need to put ourselves in the mind of the animal and think through how we can design these structures so that mountain lions will use them. Great. Well, thank you so much, Marion. We're going to say goodbye to you for now. But it, viewers, if you have a question for Marion, uh, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll save them towards the end when we get to the Q&A. All right, Marion. Um, I want to bring up our next speaker, Beth, who's going to speak a little bit about what's happening in the South and larger California. All right, Beth, the stage is yours. Hi, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. And, and again, it's just great to see everybody. I'm a little awkward with my slide, slide transitions here, but we will try. Um, so I, the, the, it's really fascinating, Marin, hearing about the science and uh, behind of connectivity and also that specific site. I could do a whole talk on the science behind um, Liberty Canyon or the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing, but I thought I'd focus a little more on the social aspect. But suffice to say, what we are trying to accomplish in uh, with the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing is a, a little different than a lot of crossings worldwide in that it is not actually related as much to roadkill as this genetic collapse because of isolation. The 101 freeway is really acting as this genetic barrier, not just for mountain lions, although they're most acutely at risk, but for all wildlife. And so reconnecting the Santa Monica Mountains to the rest of the world is sort of the aim of that crossing. A lot of crossings look at more conveyance for roadkill, get the animals across the road from point A to point B, and those are valid as well. But it is interesting um, where we look at these genetic collapses and where you might have a local extinction of a species because of unconnected habitat rather than just sort of a, a roadkill problem. So it's interesting stuff. But what I'd like to focus on is, you know, when you do have these wildlife crossings, how do you get them built? Uh, you know, it's not all about the science. Uh, I think how many species can we think of that have gone extinct despite reams of scientific papers? A big piece of this is, is the public support and the funding for these crossings. And I think it's gotten a lot better since 10 years ago when I, I think ignorance was bliss when I uh, joined the partners to get engaged, like, oh, build a wildlife crossing? Sure. How hard can that be? Well, you know, there are a lot of challenges to get uh, projects like these uh, finished. And I think what we're learning, though, is engaging the public is, is really important, which brings me to P22, the slide you see here. And I think, you know, uh, a, a lot of attention on this boy. It's been a really hard time for us losing P22, uh, such a remarkable animal. Uh, I joke he was my longest serious relationship. And uh, 
I think that it's it's been hard knowing that he's not roaming Griffith Park anymore, but his his legacy was so vast. Um, you know, this is a drawing I like to share that we do a lot of school programs about P-22 and wildlife crossings in the Los Angeles area. And, you know, it was more than just sort of a celebrity cat. You know, he was, uh, I love this quote in Rolling Stone. He was a celebrity in a land of celebrities and he influenced people uh, just not just to love mountain lions, but to actually want to take action to help preserve mountain lions in the future in the LA area and all wildlife. And just think about this, his death made Rolling Stone magazine, his death made The Economist, he was trending on Twitter. And again, that's, you know, it's great, the attention's kind of fun, but it's deeper than fun. It is, you know, this that his plight of being this lonely bachelor trapped in Griffith Park for 10 years and, you know, not being able to escape because of the freeways really did put, I think, a really human face on the problem. Uh, and really elevate, for the public at least, what wildlife crossings meant in a way that scientific papers couldn't. Now, the science is important. You have to lead with the science. I consider myself a scientist. But to get the public engaged, that's a little different, a little different, uh, you know, a little different approach that you need. I think we tend to forget sometimes how we all got engaged in wildlife uh, when we were younger or even when we were adults. It, it, you know, I didn't read scientific papers as a kid and think I want to protect wildlife. I watched Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom or read, you know, The Wind in the Willows. You know, it was those emotional connections. And this next slide, as I'm showing you, look at these memorials to P-22, whether it be a bar marquee or people setting up uh, memorials like at the Natural History Museum or the L.A. Zoo. There's a real emotional connection to this cat that translated into conservation <sighs> action. Oops. And um, I wanted to show this video because I think it really shows that well, that P-22 connected people to wildlife from all backgrounds. A lot of people who had never connected to wildlife before. And that to me is really important as well. So this is a video of the highlights from P-22 Day that I think shows this really well. <laughs> So that's the type of fostering of emotional connections, whether it be with children or adults, that gets conservation done. And I think that, you know, again, there's lessons to the P-22 story that can be applied everywhere. And I think, listen, we have to get over anthropomorphizing is bad. We have to get over that relationships, personal relationships with wildlife is bad. I think that is the only thing that is going to 
win the environmental movement and the conservation movement. And I think that that, you know, that is P22's legacy to us is that he showed us what was possible with coexisting with wildlife and also with, with engaging people to get visionary projects done like the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing. Uh, I worked on this for a decade. Uh, some of the other partners that I joined worked on it for decades. Uh, it is, it, it's pretty insane to me to contemplate that, um, that we are, let me go to the next slide, that we just broke ground. Um, it was a challenge. And Megan, to your point, I'm happy to <laughs> share lessons learned so you don't have to repeat some of our mistakes. Um, and, but here we are, it, it was done. And it was done because of a vast outswell of public support. It was done because on the government side, you had Governor Gavin Newsom and Secretary Crowfoot, uh, you know, professing support on the private side. You had Wallace Annenberg and other donors like Leonardo DiCaprio. And, you know, I could go on. It really was a great example of a collaboration. But all that was because they saw the groundswell of public and grassroots support for this, which I think really centered around P22. Oh. And here is a just a really nice feel good compilation of the actual groundbreaking. And I think you know, listen, a lot of us probably go to these events all the time. They can, it, this was such a day of joy. And I think even the elected officials were off script and being funny and not giving their usual campaign speeches. And that's what was really wonderful to show people coming together around a really hopeful project. Today, we begin to reconnect the lands and living creatures that should never have been fractured in the first place. We can begin to make the lands whole again for all. Welcome to the groundbreaking for the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing. Woohoo! So what a, a gift personally this is for me to be here and to be a small part of it, working with our remarkable colleagues in the state senate and assembly, working with local officials and federal officials. Fifty-four million dollars to stay. Uh, has put up uh, for this program and will complete the job within another $10 million, by the way. We do want to thank every single one of you, all the remarkable leaders in your own life that helped advance this cause and inspire young people and will inspire examples like this all across the rest of the country and around the rest of the world. <laughs> So I guess what I wanted to leave you with, and I, um, you have to lead with the science. The science is so vitally important. Uh, obviously, we, we, we wouldn't know that we had a threatened mountain lion population if it wasn't for the National Park Service research. We wouldn't know how to solve it with wildlife crossings if it wasn't for decades of research. Um, but it's the public support. It's the emotional connection. It's the getting people from every background, every political affiliation, whether you're, you know, however you connect, respect different connections to this work, whether you're a hip hop artist, you're a muralist, you know, however you're coming to it, try to leave room for all in these movements because it can be successful. And then the next generation of conservationists are already there when you need the next wildlife crossing. The other thing I'll also say is looking at these crossings on the scientific side a little more holistically. A lot of crossings are built with just conveyance in mind. And again, that's that's really fine if you know, you're trying to solve a roadkill problem. But what I'm hoping for in the future with crossings is, is that we actually do stitch like we're doing with Liberty Canyon ecosystem on top of it. So it's more sort of a, a whole, whole a holistic approach to reconnecting landscapes rather than just sort of this conveyance approach. And I think that may be the future for these crossings. I think California itself is really poised and supportive to be a leader here. In wildlife crossings, you have the support of Governor Newsom, Secretary Crowfoot, and more in looking at crossings across the state. And it's going to be exciting to see how those evolve. What I would say, though, is find your P22 for each project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. I really resonated with what you said about stories. Stories are how we relate to each other. And I firmly believe that while science can reach the minds of people, we also need to reach people at their hearts, 
at their core, at their spirit. And that's what I believe P22 um, and legends and icons and stories really connect us is to that feeling and even through art and music. And so I'm so excited to see and thank you so much for sharing um, all the wonderful images that you showed to us. You're welcome. Yeah, no, it, it's true. It's, it's, it's the connection to the heart that matters with anything. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, we showed we can even connect that to wildlife crossings, a really techie concept, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, can you share when we can expect to celebrate the finishing of the Wallace Annenberg crossing? Yeah. Uh, one thing you can do, I mean, it's really fun. My new favorite hobby is to drive when I'm in LA up and down the 101 just to watch construction progress. Uh, if you go to 101wildlifecrossing.org or savelacougars.org, there's a live construction cam. You can follow it from home. Most construction is at night, uh, but the ribbon cutting is looking like by the end of 2025. So it'll be, it'll be really exciting to see that. Awesome. Yeah. Hopefully that's going to come up soon. And that's something, another thing to look forward to. Can you remind us how long did this process take? I can imagine it took many meetings, many storytellings and just getting people to understand. So what, what does that process kind of look like? Yeah, I think, you know, the process, I mean, in some respects, this corridor was being planned for decades, which I really have to you know, again, call out the National Park Service and the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. They were actually talking about wildlife corridors in the late 80s and 90s before really a lot of people were. So they sort of had this visionary foresight just to be able to preserve the land on both sides, which we would not be able to have a wildlife crossing if there was not protected land on both sides. But I'd say this current push uh, for something at Liberty Canyon, a tunnel was talked about, um, uh, started in like 20, uh, 2009, 2010. I got involved in 2012 and as sort of the last partner. So I'd say the put the, putting the gas on the pedal started then where they at least had somewhat of a, a, a concept. And then we came in and, and uh, were the partner that helped drive the funding and public outreach. But boy, it is a process. Design, environmental review. These are These are not you know, these are heavy lifts that require a lot of dedication for 10 years. I haven't had a vacation in a long time, so, but they're worth it. And I think they will get easier because we now know how to plug these in with transportation agencies. We now know sort of paths where we had to, I think for Liberty Canyon, have to invent them a little bit. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Beth. We really appreciate just all the work that you've been doing and you're such a champion in this area and so grateful for you to share. So um, thanks again. We're going to say goodbye to you for now. We'll catch you a little bit later at the Q&A session. Um, and folks, if you have a question for Beth, feel free to type it in the chat. We'll save them for the end. Up next, I'd like to introduce Sarah to the stage. Welcome, Sarah. You ready Hi. to go? Yes, I think so. Thank All you. All right. Guys. Take it away. All right. Great. I'm uh, Sarah Newkirk, again, the executive director of the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. And I want to tell you a story of actually getting uh, one of these done. And um, this is a picture of Laurel Curve along Highway 17. And I've heard people describe Highway 17 as a scenic road. And to me, that phrase evokes leisurely Sunday drives with the family looking out the window at a casual pace. And Highway 17 is just about as opposite from that as you can get. My most vivid memories of driving Highway 17 are at night in a driving rain, trying to get back from the airport and just gripping the wheels. And I'm not a particularly religious individual, but I am conscious of having prayed for my life several times. When the highway was built in the 1930s, the population of Santa Cruz City was 17,000 and the population of nearby San Jose was a whopping 68,000 people. And the vehicles that were driving along Highway 17 were these big old monsters and they were probably traveling at about 45 miles an hour max. So suffice to say that people and wildlife are probably safer uh, getting across it than they are now. Times have changed and now Highway 17 is a major commuter ar artery as well as the main corridor to one of California's most important recreational destinations. But you know, human beings aren't the only ones who need transportation corridors to get from place to place, as 
um, as both uh, Marian and, and Beth highlighted, wildlife moves also and for surprisingly mundane reasons, right? They do it to look for food, for places to live, uh, to get a hot date. And this mom is moving her kittens around. So basically all the same reasons that we travel. And while the average person might not be able to spot a wildlife highway, scientists pretty much know what they look like. Um, and when wildlife connectivity is interrupted, genetic diversity can be compromised. And Beth highlighted that at the beginning of her talk. But in a more immediate sense, uh, individual members of the species can, can get killed. And here along uh, Highway 17 that you'll see on, on the map on the left, um, 350 animals have been killed along this stretch of highway in recent years. In the last five years alone, five mountain lions have been hit between Laurel Curve and Scotts Valley. Now, in an effort to improve safety for human transportation, in uh, 2012, Caltrans installed this, um, this median barrier at a particularly treacherous place um, along Laurel Curve. And this effort to increase human safety, unfortunately, made it even more difficult for animals such as deer, bobcats, foxes, and mountain lions to make their way through traffic. Um, extensive roadkill data eventually pointed to Laurel Curve as literally the deadliest section of the highway for wildlife. Now, nobody likes roadkill data, but these were exactly the kind of data that provided the impetus that we needed to begin exploring options for a wildlife crossing here. Um, here's a picture of a, a wildlife biologist probably questioning her life choices, um, but Pathways for Wildlife and Caltrans conducted a detailed field survey of all the culverts across Highway 17 between Santa Cruz and the summit. And what the report showed was that there are surprisingly few culverts along the stretch of highway and none were large enough or straight enough to really serve as a wildlife crossing. Um, these culverts were also located predominantly in heavily developed areas where the Santa Cruz Puma Project's research showed that mountain lions were much less li likely to travel. Um, so the report concluded that Laurel Curve really was the most suitable location by a long shot to create a wildlife linkage across Highway 17. So to review, there are three factors that pointed to this place. First, the significant density of road kills at Laurel Curve, and I, I'm 50% of the wildlife collisions occurring on 17 in Santa Cruz County occur there. So it's really not, uh, not even close. Um, obviously, the animals are trying to use this spot to get across um, by themselves. And then second, there are several large undeveloped properties along either side of the highway at Laurel Curve, making that part of the corridor vastly more appealing for wildlife than the more densely developed neighborhoods nearby. And then lastly, as a natural drainage, there's a natural drainage at that spot that effectively funnels wildlife um, to that location, really without the need um, for, for directional fencing. So now that we know what's needed and where, the question was how? And at the time we started um, uh, doing this project um, back in 2007, um, there really wasn't any playbook for the implementation of wildlife crossings in California. Nevertheless, when a 10 acre parcel adjacent to the highway at Laurel Curve, and you can see uh, where the yellow star is up in the northern part of this slide. When a ten an acre parcel became available, came up for sale, we took a pretty big leap of faith that we could figure out a process um, uh, to get, get an infrastructure project located there. So we partnered with the Packard Foundation to purchase and place conservation easements on this first 10 acre property uh, to pr protect the land from future development and to give us some rights to um, uh, to uh, proactively promote a wildlife crossing there. Um, over the next seven years, the land trust would eventually protect a total of 460 acres of land on either side. And you can see these uh, aggregated parcels in green um, on either side of Laurel Curve uh, to ensure the viability of this wildlife crossing. So the rest of the project was entirely dependent on partnerships. And uh, the first one I want to highlight, um, amazingly, is with Caltrans itself. The project could never have gotten off the ground without the passionate advocacy of Caltrans biologists Nancy Seipel and Morgan Robertson. These two incredible women 
were looking at exactly the same science that we were looking at and they knew exactly what needed to be done. But even so, Caltrans is a big bureaucracy and one that has a massive workload. So given maintenance and repair obligations, Caltrans headquarters was getting a hard time wrapping its organizational head around what the incentive was to work on something like this. Um, so what was necessary was some sort of a mitigation arrangement in which the agency could get credit for this environmentally beneficial project um, to offset the environmental impacts of other work in the area. Now, I wasn't there, but the story I heard was that Assemblyman Mark Stone and Senator John Laird basically got representatives of Caltrans and CDFW into a room and wouldn't let them leave until a mitigation agreement was negotiated. So the lesson is, it's great to have your local leaders by your side in these projects. Ultimately, the agreement gave Caltrans valuable mitigation credits that it could use to offset future project impacts in District 5. Uh, this original mitigation credit agreement was meant to be a one-off, but it worked so well that Senator Stern wrote a bill, SB 790, that institutionalized the approach and gave Caltrans the incentive to pursue future wildlife crossings in uh, all across California. So over this same time period, we were working to solve the funding puzzle and uh, the Land, Tr Land Trust of Santa Cruz County uh, basically provided over 2 million in local donations toward construction capital, as well as 10 million in purchase property rights on both sides of Highway 17. Um, the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission was also a big funder uh, through the original Measure D in 2016, which um, uh, created 5 million local uh, sales tax funding toward construction capital. And then um, uh, Caltrans funded uh, the other roughly 5 million uh, part of the project. So I'm, this is the most exciting part of my presentation right here. I'm really excited to show you these before and after shots. So here is the site of the wildlife crossing right before the digging began. And there it is afterward. So Granite Rock and Caltrans are right now putting the final touches on re-landscaping around the undercrossing, but it's pretty much finished. We will be working with Pathways for Wildlife to set up cams later this month and can't wait to share those first pictures. We've already found bobcat and deer tracks making their way through the tunnel. And so hopefully that means that wildlife families like this one will be able to follow their instincts and move without risk, or at least not that particular risk. Um, but for us, Laurel Curve is just the first part of this tale of wildlife connectivity. Um, connecting to the Gabalon Range is the way we're going to really maintain genetic diversity. And um, the next critical step is um, as 101 is effectively a hard barrier for all wildlife trying to cross it. So in this map, what you can see in this yellow shaded area um, is um, basically uh, wildlife corridor suitability based on CDFW data. And as you can see, there's a critical choke point right where the yellow shaded area crosses the 101 near the bottom of the slide. And so you won't be surprised to find out that that location is also a hot spot for wildlife vehicle collisions. Um, and Pathways for Wildlife actually tracked one mountain lion that literally made it across Highway 17 only to be killed at this spot on the 101 as he attempted to make his way into the Gabalon Range. So just to the south of 101 on this place is Rocks Ranch. And the Land Trust knew that Rocks Ranch had to be secured in order to build a second wildlife crossing over 101. Um, Rocks Ranch is an amazing place. It's a 2,600 acre property containing a 4.4 mile long stretch of intact habitat that's highly permeable to animal movement. And in 2018, San Benito County General Plans proposed several development projects here. Uh, think condos, golf courses, and a water park. Um, the Land Trust decided at that time that there was, it had to find a way to preserve rocks immediately and we were able to get a conservation buyer to purchase it on our behalf with three years to fundraise to buy it back. And I'm pleased to say uh, that the Land Trust closed on our acquisition of Rocks Ranch uh, from the conservation buyer on December 22nd. So we're off and running. Caltrans has already released a project initiation document for Highway 101 crossing, 
and thanks to the pioneering work of the Land Trust and our partners at Laurel Curve, the policy and process tools are already in place. Um, this project overall um, uh, is an incre increased focus on wildlife connectivity in California and beyond and um, accelerated the pace of development of these critical pieces of infrastructure. Um, and so with that, I'm happy to turn it back over to Megan. Wow, congrats on the closing of Rocks Ranch. That's very exciting news. Um, Sarah, I'm interested. It seems like there's so much happening, so many people you need to talk to, all of these partners that you need to get on the same page. I'm curious, what is that story that you told um, all these different agencies, these partners, about why this needs to happen? How did you corral everybody around this cause? I, you know, it was, as, as, I, as I said, Megan, it was it really the right people being in the right place at the right time, right? It, it helped tremendously to have Caltrans biologists on board from the first moment, right? They were part of the scientific, found, building the scientific case uh, for the wildlife crossing at that spot. It was also absolutely critical to have the support of local elected officials. And I, I strongly believe that that comes from exactly the kinds of things that Beth was talking about. You, know, you have to build the public foundation of support uh, before you can bring these elected officials along. And, um, and, and so that was clearly critical too. And measure D, the measure that raised the money that the public, uh, the public part of the funding, a local public part of the funding, um, was passed by uh, you know seventy percent of the voters. It was a two-thirds uh, vote, and it, it won handily. And so it was just a tremendous, uh, a, a tremendous outpouring of support from from lots of different channels. Hmm, okay. So what I'm hearing and learning from all the speakers tonight is the kind of perfect formula to make this happen is really rest on things like science, like stories and relationships, and that's how we can have success with building more wildlife connectivity, not just in the Bay Area and LA, but all in California, as well as um, across the nation, because this is just not an isolated thing. Wildlife need pathways everywhere. Um, well, thank you so much, Sarah. And let's bring in all our speakers back again so that we can hear from them. Thank you, speakers. I really enjoyed learning from you all. Um, for first, before we jump into the Q&A, did you have anything you wanted to share with each other? Um, yeah. I just want to say that I've been following the Coyote Valley and I've actually been there. I think, you know, what I think all of these, uh, you know, and appropriate to the, the title of the talk and is that cities, you can't write them off. They are part of the conservation equation. Uh, and indeed, in some respects, just as vitally as important as national parks or other protected areas that we, I think, more associate with where wildlife should be. And so it's really heartening to me that we are starting to factor yeah, either urban or suburban or human spaces into where we need to do conservation. And I think these projects we're all talking about here uh, fit that equation, which I think 10 years ago would not have been as well, you know, accepted by the public. Mm. Thanks, Beth. Mary and Sarah, any reflections? Yeah, I'll just say that it's just fascinating to hear both Beth and Sarah talk and the different perspectives that you're bringing to how we think about wildlife. And I am very much a scientist and so my mind gravitates towards that, but I also love to write. And so thinking about stories and storytelling and, and hearing from Beth about that is just uh, sparking some creative thoughts for me as well. And likewise, I think that I come uh, to this work primarily focused on partnerships and negotiation and it was, um, I, you know, I, I'm both inspired by the science and was glad to hear Marion's comments and also inspired by sort of the public outpouring and um, uh, P22 was just such a, a wonderful um, individual, really, and a member of the community. <laughs> um, and we were fortunate to have him. All right. Thank you. So we reached our Q&A session part of the evening. I have a list of pre-submitted questions from the viewers who submitted it during the registration process that I'll read, but you can also ask your questions in the chat and we will do our best to get to them. Um, so I'll start with my questions, then we'll get to the viewers' questions later. All right, first question I have is for you, Marion. With the linkages slowly disappearing, are population centers experiencing divergent DNA? Are there any behavioral changes that we can track? What do you think? 
Yeah, so I think Beth did a great job of touching on this um, in the Santa Monica, Monica Mountains um, in Southern California, where the mountain lion populations are becoming so isolated that there's genetic inbreeding happening. Um, and we're having a similar uh, situation occurring in the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is why both the Central Coast population and the Southern, Santa, uh, Southern California populations of mountain lion is listed as a potential candidate species um, with the California Endangered Species Act. So yeah, it's definitely a, a big issue and something that uh, we're tracking and, and need to address. And in terms of behave, behavioral changes, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, thinking about the Santa Cruz Mountains, um, seeing more interactions between mountain lions and people uh, as we see more development, more roads, hemming in, uh, penning in animals in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Animals don't have places to move and expand their habitat. So we're seeing um, more sightings of mountain lions in places where humans recreate. Um, last year, there was a juvenile mountain lion that got stuck in an elementary school. It was just terrified, just trying to find a way to establish its own new territory. So we're seeing uh, situations like that occur. And so we're seeing these changes in behavior of, of animals that are trying to find ways to move and, and expand and have habitat, but they're getting constrained by our roads and our development. Thank you, Marianne. Um, we have a question from the audience that I'd like to highlight. Um, Ronald asks, what are the trade-offs of underpasses and overpasses? We've talked about bridges, we've talked about culverts. How do we side when and where do we build what kind? I can take that because, you know, having gone through that or uh, obviously and others can too, but, you know, every wildlife crossing site specific. And I think it depends on your goals. It depends on your geography. It depends on the species uh, you're trying to, to tackle. We looked at everything for Liberty Canyon and an overpass was the whole, the overpass is the whole scale ecosystem solution. You know, all wildlife's going to use it as, if, if you do put a landscape on top of it. Um, you know, some wildlife is, I think, uh, Marion alluded to, or um, yeah, in, in, um, in her talk was, you know, won't sometimes use a tunnels or underpasses. Uh, so it really depends. And it also depends on what you have to work with. Not every site you could put an overpass in. So they are really are all site specific. Some work for some species in some locations, some don't. And that's where I think, again, back to that science, you really have to be rigorous about that scientific assessment. What can you realistically build here? What species are you trying to um, you know, lure across the road? And you know, those are questions that really you know, differ with each project. Anybody else want to, um, and we did look at a tunnel under the 101, um, thinking it would be cheaper than an overpass. It was not. Try, dr you can't even drill under a 10 lane freeway, so. <laughs> Mary and Sarah. I'll, I'll just add to that, that, um, you know, the uh, Laurel Curve site on Highway 17 is a natural drainage, right? It, it was a place where, uh, before they put the highway in, it was effectively a divot in the land and all that stuff that you were looking at in my before picture was filled that had to be sort of put under uh, the highway other with that, you know, um, when they were building that. And so effectively what we were doing was pulling all of that out and letting the wildlife just continue along their way in this um, sort of natural drainage on, on the Rocks Ranch site. That's likely, you know, we, we don't really have the designs yet, but it's likely to be an overpass because it's almost the opposite, right? The highway is running through effectively a valley um, that would be sort of connected. And, and to Beth's point, you know, what's cheaper? Apparently, you can just get the pieces of these overpasses kind of modularly brought in. <laughs> um, and that, that is often vastly cheaper than the underpass. Mary, anything else to add or? Yeah, I think this is really top of mind for me as we start thinking about wildlife crossing options for Monterey Road and thinking through all the things that Beth and Sarah mentioned about topography and the focal species we're trying to um, benefit and uh, all these other factors that might influence whether we go with culverts or underpasses, overpass, things of that nature. So it really is like a lot of different criteria and questions that we need to sort through. Thank you. Uh, next question. Will more wildlife bridges be built in California? If so, when and where? I mean, feel free to mention the ones you've already mentioned, but what are the other ones we could look forward to? 
Uh, the good news is absolutely yes. And I think it, what's been really wondrous about um, the Wallace Annenberg Crossing and, and uh, these other projects is they're fueling more. Uh, you know, I have the good fortune of working with Governor Newsom and Secretary Crowfoot, and I can tell you they want to do more. Governor Newsom is putting his money where his mouth is, too. And I mean, we have $100 million to date allocated in the um, agency funding for wildlife crossings. Uh, so I think that they really, especially connected to 3030, want to um, be the new leader in the states in wildlife crossings. And there are several projects uh, I'm even in. Um, you know, that are on my radar, like some on 395, the Coyote Valley, there's just, there's a, there's a lot that are ready to come out of the gate with funding. And I think, um, you know, Sarah and Marion, that's, I'm sure that's your experience. There's, there's your projects, you know, ready to go or, and some are underway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Beth, you mentioned 30 by 30. That's another question we had. And maybe I was hoping, Sarah, would you be willing to talk about like how this work is aligned with Governor Newsom's um, 30 by 30 goal? Sure, and just you know, for the audience, 30 by 30 uh, refers to a commitment to protect 30% of the lands and coastal waters by 2030. And the California initiative is embedded within sort of a larger national initiative um, and that even sort of a global effort to accelerate the protection and conservation of, of open space for, for wildlife and habitat. Um, uh, and connectivity has got to be, right? it's not just, uh, this is not a bucks for acres exercise. This, uh, connectivity has got to be a part of that, again, because of the genetic components. Um, there's uh, no point in um, conserving lands that are unconnected, disconnected from each other so that people, uh, species can become uh, locally extinct because of um, genetic collapse. And um, uh, they've already seen uh, a lot of evidence of, of, of extreme genetic isolation in the mountain lines in, this, in Southern California. We're starting to see the uh, first signs of that, the outward signs of that in our area with the kinked tails and so forth. Um, and there's clearly a lot going on under, under the surface. And so uh, connectivity has got to be a big piece of 30 by 30. Um, and the, uh, you know, with the California state effort is, as, as Beth alluded to, driving a tremendous amount of money to, um, right, they're, put, they're putting their money where their mouth is. Um, the money for the wildlife crossings, the money for the acquisition, right, what Lou highlighted in my uh, remarks was the need to protect land on both sides of the highway, right? And that's a very expensive proposition uh, if you need to do that for each, each and every one of the crossings that you put in. Um, and so the state is really accelerating this. Um, they're very serious about it. Uh, they're developing policy and they're putting their money where their mouth is. Excellent. We have a question from the audience that kind of um, adds to that from Albert. I believe he's asking, is this movement more like at a legislation federal level or is it really like grassroots or um, movement with conservation organizations really getting involved or is it kind of just all of the above? Uh, personally, all of the above at this point, I think you are seeing a groundswell of support for wildlife crossings. They are, you know, very bipartisan, supported by both sides, you know, uh, Republicans, Democrats. Uh, Biden's administration and the last infrastructure bill or the not this current one, but put in 350 million for wildlife crossings. You have a lot of states. You know, I was just reading about New Mexico, you know, prioritizing this. So I think you're seeing it on all sides and the grassroots level and local. Uh, so it to me, um, uh, Louis Sagan wrote in the L.A. Times for an article he did that, you know, we'll look back on this time as the age of wildlife crossings. And I think he's right. I think it is really like it's that perfect storm or that moment where everything's coming together, the science, the public support and the support from both state and federal agencies uh, with the funding. It sounds like there's so much, yeah, so much movement and energy happening right now. Um, another question from the audience, I'm going to ask two questions, maybe Mary, if you want to try this one. First question from Ronald is, do wildlife use recreational trails and trail crossings? Can trails be designed to be more wildlife friendly? And the second question is, how are wildlife faring with these um, in emergency situations like the floodings that we've been seeing and the wildfires that have happened in our summers? Yeah, so I'll tackle the second question first. Uh, so yeah, we've obviously been having a lot of rain 
And as I talked about previously, some of these culverts that are constructed beneath highways are for water conveyance and for moving water so that they're not flooding roads. And so when we have these big rain events that are flooding these culverts, animals that might use those culverts for passage are forced, are, are, aren't able to use those anymore. And so we might see more animals trying to cross the road at grade, which obviously is a dangerous situation and animals can get hit by vehicles and it, it's, a, it's bad for animals and it's bad for people too. And for the first question around um, multi-use crossings where we might have a trail with a wildlife crossing as well, uh, it really depends on the species. I think it generally, um, the literature has shown that it's not as effective as wildlife specific crossings. Um, people, even passive recreation can have impacts on wildlife and negative impacts in their behavior. So generally, whenever we can do wildlife crossings that are just for wildlife and have separate crossings for people, I think that's gonna be most effective, especially in these urban areas where so much of the land base is for people, including our protected areas where recreation and trails are their own form of um, fragmentation of the landscape for wildlife as well. And can I add to that, Mary? And I think, you know, I think you, there's, there's times when absolutely, you know, these things can be shared, but I also think it begs the larger question of, it's not just roads that impede connectivity and like where we put our trails is, can be yeah. just as destructive. And so we have to kind of rethink not just roads, but all of our recreation. For example, there's a, um, the drive to put a new trail and up near where I live uh, for mountain bikes and others. And listen, I mountain bike, I'm not against it, but would take out the new population, right? I think, you know, we, we used to think of trails as kind of harmless, but they're not, they can impede connectivity as well. So I think this whole issue of connectivity for me has opened my eyes to how any of our human activities, whether it be driving, mountain biking, hiking, horseback riding, putting up a fence in my yard, how that impacts wildlife connectivity. And so it's this, it's this really deep issue that I think has us needing to reconsider not just our roadways, but almost everything we do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you bring up a great point, the you know hard balance to strike between recreation and wildlife, I guess. What kind of path forward do you see to, in order to find that balance? Because um, I feel like that's a real, real issue right now? Uh, you know, I'd love to hear from the other panel members. I, I think it is a balance. You know, I, I, I think that there are, you know, I love Marion's question. There were, there were some calls to put, you know, put a trail uh, early on. We had a trail across the Liberty Canyon um, crossing because there's a trail on both sides. And we thought, well, the occasional hiker won't bother it. But, you know, the public outcry about giving wildlife primacy was, I thought, a good one. Okay, you know, that, like to Marion's point, they don't have a lot of just wildlife only spaces. But I do think it's, you know, recreation. I'm a recreationist. I hike, I bike, I, you know, do all those things. But, you know, I think we have to put some limits on it and, 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 and sort of recognize, you know, where it is impacting wildlife the most. You know, this is where science comes in. And, and we do have to put some limits because it can be just as destructive as a roadway. Um, but I do think it's a balance. We want people to be able to enjoy the outdoors, but just maybe not, you know, every trail has to be, you know, a, high, a, a, a really one that's used by everything, right? There is probably appropriate uses for appropriate areas, or you do strike a balance sometimes with, okay, if it's new migration season, instead of, you know, maybe you close a trail for a little bit. Um, you know, I work, you know, in Yosemite for a decade, when it was peregrine nesting season, they would close those areas to rock climbers. So I think it's just rethinking how we manage recreation, but also for new, um, you know, for new recreational elements, we may just not be able to put some things in some places. And, and that is hard, but I think putting some limits is really going to be key. Definitely. It's going to be hard, especially when you try to, you know, make everybody happy. So at least someone's going to be a little upset. Um, Sarah, can you let maybe give us a little insight? Like, are these the kind of questions you're considering in these process when you're planning where, you know, to put the next crossing and talking with all these stakeholders? Like, what are the other questions to consider? You know, we, it's, it's, it's funny that you, you mentioned it. We, another project that we have with POST, another partnership that we have with POST is the San Vicente Redwoods. Uh, project where um, uh, the four land trusts sort of got together to protect this place. 
um, uh, the land the land trust is is uh, primarily responsible for sort of um, building and maintaining the trail network. And it would have been impossible. I mean, there's the the main goal of the conservation project of the San Vicente Redwoods was to protect the natural resources and protect the wildlife. And so the recreational trails, um, you know, I, I strongly believe that recreational trails are important because they do exactly what P22 did for the Los Angeles region, right? They connect people to uh, things that they might not really be connected or feel passionate about in the absence of those kind of things. Um, and uh, there was a lot of, when we, we first started to protect that area, there was a lot of uh, concern about the trails and, and would they be compatible with mountain lion denning and the other um, endangered and endemic species that are in there. It was just a tremendous, you know, vision, it, vision combined with hard work and planning. And the trail network really occupies a, a, a relatively small component of the landscape relative to the larger protected area. And I think that that's just what has to be done, right? That's different uses to the extent that they're incompatible have to be you know, somewhat segregated from one another. And that's just like you know, basic zoning 101, right? So we have the recreational trail piece, the mountain lion denning, and, and then you have to monitor the heck out of it so that you know if there are gonna be impacts, you have to watch for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so, you know, speaking of mountain lions, we had a question who was curious about P22 from Gina. Um, you can clarify why, what, what happened with P22 and his surgery. Yeah, no, it, you know, we've been getting that question a lot. And uh, listen, I can tell you as the person that was there, here's what happened. <laughs> um, it, it was a really hard decision. Um, when he was first captured, um, you know, they brought him to sort of the emergency room at the LA zoo to try to get him stable at that point, you know, they didn't know the extent of his injuries, but he was at least stable. Um, I was in constant contact with the director of California department of fish and wildlife daily. He was giving me updates. They were trying to place him in a sanctuary early that week after capture, but then some of the, some of the testing results came back and, um, I think, again, it shows a, sort of a new era of wildlife management when they allow a wildlife activist like me in the room. Um, they invited me down to San Diego, had the vets meet with me. I was in a conference room showing me all the testing results on a video screen, not a dry eye in the room. All these agency folks were all passing tissues around and it was just pretty evident. The vehicle strike was one thing and they actually were when when that test result came back saying, well, it would be risky surgery, but we probably could fix this. What was happening was his organs were herniating into his chest cavity. He was having a lot of trouble, you know, trouble breathing because he couldn't. That was probably fixable, although risky. But then some of the other test results came back. Stage two kidney failure was another thing. Heart disease. You know, keep in mind when, you know, a, you know, somebody like uh, when a wild mountain lion has something like kidney failure. People are asking me, well, we had cats. We kept them alive for another month by putting them on fluids. Anytime you do something to a mountain lion, you have to put them under. That's risky. And so uh, these tests came back with that. There was a number of other things, um, head trauma. Uh, it just, it was going to be managed care existence, not a sanctuary suffering, you know, not a nice sanctuary where he could live out the rest of his days. And that ethically, and I think for most of us, we wouldn't do that to our own our own animals that we have in our homes. So they did everything they could. And tell, let me tell you, as P22's biggest advocate, I would be the biggest person out crying if they, they didn't. So mm -hmm. it's a good question, but th these agencies wanted, they wanted to keep P22 alive as much as any of us. So mm -hmm. they really did try, but it just, the writing was on the wall after all that testing results came back. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing and rest in peace P22. Um, there is a celebration of life event happening in February is it going I hear there's a live stream available like yeah can people watch it yes it's February 4th at the Greek theater from 12 to 2 when we will have a live stream uh, on our Save LA Cougars site you can also tune into his Facebook page for more information but you will be able to watch it wherever you are uh, again it shows that emotional connection uh much like Taylor Swift, P22 crashed Ticketmaster. <laughs> we <laughs> sold out in like two hours. Yeah. So uh, even though the tickets were free. Uh, so it's just kind of a testament to, again, the, the relationship people, not just in LA, but all over the world have to this, this mm -hmm. mountain lion. 
Thank you, Beth. Okay, I think we have time to squeeze in a few more questions. I'm gonna ask a few more. Maybe we can do our best to answer them pretty quickly. I like this question from Mary who asks, were any of the native tribes contacted to find out about their knowledge of Animal Crossings or were indigenous partners considered in, um, in this work? Um, maybe Marianne, do you have a thought on that or Sarah? Yeah, I can start and just say, you know, I'm going to mention this later on as well, but with the Coyote Valley master planning process that's going to be happening, there's going to be a tribal engagement component of that. So looking forward to um, working with our local tribes and understanding what they would like to see in Coyote Valley and in understanding the indigenous knowledge there as well. Yeah, and we, we've been working really closely with the Amamotsin Land Trust and uh, some of the other tribes uh, on the um, Rocks Ranch project, planning around that and planning on the connectivity project there. Thank you. And I, I'll just add too, for Liberty Canyon, we actually have, um, uh, have been very inclusive with the tribes and actually have um, Alan Salazar as part of the Chumash where the crossing's located um, as part of the design team, a paid person on the design team. I will say, you know, for a lot of these crossings and especially these urban areas, just to be clear, these are not historical crossing, you know, animal corridors, right? These are all we have left, right? That, you know, so, you know, it, it's not a matter of we can locate where these, you know, animal migrations have occurred for thousands of years. Probably all those sites are gone. What we're all having to deal with in these areas is, okay, where do we have green space and where can we put a crossing? But having said that, like all of us, indigenous knowledge is very important. Uh, not just the, you know, the science around their knowledge of where these animals were, but also the cultural component. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you all for sharing. Um, Jen asks, is there a way we can view webcam or live stream footage of culvert activities or maybe a soft pitch to install one because it could get people invested? Um, Marianne or Sarah? We've been thinking about it for uh, Highway 17 and we're working with Pathways for Wildlife to install cameras, uh, take, take pictures of who goes by. I don't think that it'll be live stream. I love that idea. I personally would like watch it all day, um, but I, I don't think that we're quite there yet. Okay. Um, all right, well, my last question from the audience is, is there another way to make wildlife crossing other than underpass or overpass? Or are those like kind of the main um, channels that we're trying to use? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if crossing is a definition, but there's certainly ways to improve connectivity um, that don't involve a structure, such as exclusionary fencing, leading them to places where it may be safer to cross. Um, using existing structures, um, there's a railroad tunnel on the, I think it's the 118, just north of the Liberty Canyon site on the next freeway that, you know, some animals will use, not all. Um, I've seen, you know, I mean, there's a lot of creative wildlife crossings too, for like newts and turtles. And I know it's not really a, a one you'd want to scale up, but one of my favorite tales of how to get animals across the road, uh, it's um, the toad crossing. It's, I think it's Pennsylvania. We show that, uh, that film, um, uh, at some point where actually you had all these volunteers during toad season go out with buckets, you know, for a couple of weeks and actually put the toads in buckets and take them across the road. So I think there's a lot of creative ways, but also landscape design can be a piece of, of how to get, you know, how to help improve connectivity, but there's no doubt getting an animal across an actual road is usually going to involve a structure. I don't know, Marion or Sarah, if you have other thoughts on that. Yeah, well, one thing that came to mind for me was for arboreal species, the species that live and spend all their time in trees. Like if you think just, you know, a, you know, telephone line or electric line is a wildlife crossing for squirrels to get across roads safely. And there are places throughout the world where arboreal crossing structures have been installed for like monkeys and other animals that are spending all, you know, most of their lives up in the trees and need to be moving across these roads as well, where you might not have these branches extending across the road so they don't have these natural movement paths anymore. Wow, pretty cool. Sarah, anything to add? Nothing to add, that all sounds great. All right. Well, thank you so much, speakers. I learned so much from you. And thank you, audience members, for your great questions. Before we close, let's do one last round robin. 
um, speakers, if you could share one last thing, words of wisdom, some exciting announcements to look forward to, a call to action, anything, um, now's your chance. We'd love to hear from you. Why don't we start with you, Marion? Yeah, well, I'm just reflecting on the conversations we've had here tonight and about how we need the science, we need the advocacy, the stories, the partnerships to make this work. So it's so great to be with um, these other speakers and have that expertise represented here today. Um, and in terms of a call to action, um, if you're interested in getting more involved in Coyote Valley, um, as I mentioned previously, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority is doing a planning process for the conserved lands in Coyote Valley. And uh, there will be a public engagement process for that project. And so if you'd like to get involved and give some input on what you'd like to see in Coyote Valley, um, Megan will put a link in the chat. And I'll pass it over to Beth. Thanks, Marion. Yeah, I, I think my uh, what I just want to tell people is, listen, dream big. You have to um, because there's too much at risk. Uh, you know, we were told we were crazy uh, 10 years ago or even longer. Um, you'll never raise that much money. You'll never be able to build a, a crossing just for, you know, for mountain lions, it, whatever it was. And I think that, uh, you know, the uh, listen, we have some big problems with biodiversity and obviously in, in, um, in climate resiliency that we can't afford to wait. So just don't give up. I think that, you know, it shows that if, if you can commit, these projects are realistic, despite what folks say. Um, and I guess my uh, call to action is, you know, if you want to get involved with our effort, save LACougars.org. But I think the, the best thing you can do, I think, is local. Local leadership, make sure you vote for people who, who support funding and ag advocacy advocacy for for either you know wildlife crossings or any conservation stuff i think really voting but getting involved yourself we just you know we just need more boots on the ground that are going to help and you don't need to be a scientist you don't need to you know, be an, a lawyer to get involved you know these projects take grassroots support and that can come from anybody and i will awesome. pass it to sarah Thanks, Beth. Um, I, all I'll say is uh, keep your eyes out for uh, news of the next wildlife crossing uh, across 101 in San Benito County uh, at Rocks Ranch. Um, we just closed on it last month. I'm so excited to get going on that project. And I'll pass it back to Megan. Woo! Thank you, speakers, audience members. Please give them love in the chat. There's already so much coming through. Um, I learned so much from you all, and like you heard it, get involved, um, let's share some stories, vote, and uh, take action. Um, all right, speakers, before we say goodbye, let's uh, take a photo by smiling, and we'll take a screen capture later. And thanks again for a wonderful evening. Um, we'll say goodbye to you for now. Thank you so much, Beth, Hi, Sarah, Marion. All right. Well, viewers, you made it to the end. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. If you like tonight's event, you might like our next event, which is happening on February 9th at 7 p.m., hosted by the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority in partnership with POST. We're hosting an online event with the Golden Eagles of the Northern Diablo Range in California. You can scan that QR code or visit our website, openspacetrust.org slash events to register and learn more. And then next, the months after that, will be a TikTok, science and safety, how you can keep yourself safe from ticks when you go out on your next outdoor adventure. That's going to happen on March 9th at 7 p.m. Save the date, and you can register when that page is live at our website. And that's going to be hosted in partnership with the Bay Area Lyme Foundation. And last but not least, if you love tonight's event, we want to know, please consider filling out this feedback form. You can scan it with your phone or visit the link in the chat. It'll only take a few minutes, but your feedback is so important because it helps us improve our events so we can keep bringing you quality content every time. All right, well, that's enough for me. Once again, my name is Megan Wynn. I'm so excited to um, be here with you tonight and I'm very grateful for our speakers and I uh, hope you enjoyed the rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody.